Hello and welcome to Common Ground, an inside look at Suffolk County. I'm your host, Sheriff Steve Tompkins. Now, today's show is going to be off the charts, crazy fun today. You know how much I love politics, but I've got two guys here that actually worked together for quite some time that know each other very well, and so you know what kind of a Donnybrook this is going to be. We're going to start with Mike McCormick here from the McCormick Law Firm, and to be followed by Tom Keedy, a good friend uh, from Boston College, Vice President of Community Affairs over at BC, my alma mater, best school ever. Sorry, honey, I know you did the BU thing, but BC is the best <laughs> there is. Hey, guys, thanks for coming in. Really appreciate it. Sure. You know, how was it navigating through the snow today? Not too bad? Actually, uh, I, I was surprised. It, it was, uh, wasn't bad at all. It, uh, the streets of, uh, they were obviously, uh, the mayor's office has uh, really got a lot of equipment out there, and it's uh, getting much better. Let me ask you that. I, I've heard in times of old that um, a really bad snowstorm could actually make or break a mayor, depending upon how quickly they can get that stuff and out, up and out of there. Now, this is sure. extraordinary. Mother Nature's really beating us down. But is there any truth to that? I mean, if, do people really get that angry if, the, if you can't get the snow out of the oh, way? Oh, boy. Yes, do they, they do. Really? Uh, a couple of examples. Uh, Jane Byrne in Chicago, Belangic in Chicago, mm -hmm. uh, the mayor of uh, New York City. I'm, I'm blanking on his name. Uh, Tom, do you remember who? Uh, John Lindsay. John, John Lindsay. John Lindsay. And, and it, when the storm hit, it was like, yeah. really, the snow outside? Yeah, yeah. It doesn't bother me and my limousine and my yeah. driver. Yeah. So <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, it really can. And yeah. it's people, um, you know, I think this storm is exceptionally yeah. uh, uh, catastrophic from, you know, cleaning and yeah. so forth. But, Somebody uh, told me the other day, this is what happens when the Patriots keep winning the Super Bowl, because the rest yeah. of the country is just pissed off at New England for winning so many championships that this is what we get. Well, Can I think there's some truth, <laughs> <laughs> don't you think? <laughs> but you know what? Keep winning. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, so Tom, let, let, let me jump in with you real quickly and talk to me about, uh, let's start with the mayor's administration and how Marty is comporting himself over the past year, the folks that he's surrounded himself with, and the job that he's doing. What do you think? I think he's doing very well, uh, considering, you know, he's been in office now a year. Um, I think diversity is a big part of the administration. Uh, the first couple of weeks, you clearly saw that with then acting Commissioner Evans becoming Commissioner Evans mm -hmm. and then diversifying the command staff. I think the mayor has taken a different approach to uh, appointing his commissioners and his team and taking, it, taking his time. Uh, some mm -hmm. people would say, well, why didn't you come out of the box and naming your department heads right away? And I think that the mayor took his time, uh, interviewed people, reviewed current commissioners and assistant commissioners, and I think he's done a very good job uh, so far in, in putting the team together. And I think uh, some of the poll results that you've seen the last few weeks uh, show that. Following a mayor like uh, Mayor Menino, you have a, a new guy in there, Dorchester kid, knows the streets. But I get the sense that Marty could not only just walk with the people and communicate with the people that are from the neighborhoods, but that he could also sit with folks like the president and higher ups to really talk about what the needs are for his city. Do you get that sense that he really has his legs up underneath him? I do. Um, I, I think he's off to a terrific start. Um, you know, he's a different mayor than Tom Anino, who was my friend and... and I was a big fan of Tom Menino, but I'm a big fan of Marty Walsh. It's, mm -hmm. I think he's really, uh, he, as Tom said correctly, that he took his time. He's appointed some terrific uh, commissioners, uh, you know, beginning with the police commissioner and, and Mike Dennehy, if, uh, you know, the public works uh, mm -hmm. folks. They're, they're really terrific people. And, How about education? And hard worker. You think he's taking too long to get a new uh, superintendent for schools? Uh, I'd rather see him do it right mm -hmm. than to, you know, I think John McDonough, I, I, I think is doing a, a very, very credible like John, job yeah. as the interim. Um, yeah. But I, I think, uh, you know, it's such an important position. It's going to be uh, really this administration because he's sort of announced that, he, you know, he's going to put a lot of currency in, into improving the schools. So I think he needs to do what he's doing, take his time and find the right person. When you talk about currencies, and I want to ask both of you what your thoughts are, he's putting currency behind the 2024 Olympics bid also. What do you think about the city trying to handle something like that? Um, why not? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of Boston, and I'd love to see them do it right. Uh, a, a lot of what's going to go into it is planning for the future. Mm -hmm. 2024, we'll be here before we know it. 
uh, we don't have to look further than the MBTA and the mm -hmm. problems they're having mm -hmm. uh, in terms of equipment. Uh, the equipment's old. They need to invest in public transit. And one way to do it is to do it through the sort of the prism of the Olympics. So the naysayers, Tommy, say that, you know, you can do all of the infrastructure build out without having the Olympics come in, other things that we should prioritize those dollars in a different sort of way. I'm from a different school of thought. I kind of side with Michael in that I think it would be a great thing for the city. I think it would be a great thing for the region, frankly. But you've worked on a number of big ticket events and, and campaigns. What's your thoughts? I think, first of all, it's a great planning tool for the city, whether or not we're selected in 2017. Uh, it gives us the opportunity to really look at our infrastructure, what our needs are for the city, and to really go out into the community, do some serious planning, you know, transportation, the environment, you know, bike lanes, you know, uh, zip cars, how people are going to move for the next 10, 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is, number one, a priority for the mayor, whether or not we were you know, uh, selected for the Olympics. The second thing is, you know, go back to, you know, Kevin White days. You know, the tall ships, bidding on the tall ships. And everybody said, ah, oh, you know, the tall ships, that's going to close the city down. And look at what it did for the city mm -hmm. going back to his administration. Then you look at the presidential debate at UMass. Okay, people said, a debate at UMass Boston? Why not? And then from there, it went to the All-Star Game. And we did the All-Star Game. Mm -hmm. And then we did the Democratic Convention. That's right, that's right. And so there's a history of doubters saying, never Boston. Mm -hmm. Here we have the opportunity. At least we're competing. We may get it or we may not. But in the entire North American continent, we were selected. And this, that says something about the people of Boston. And you know what's interesting about that is I heard that part of the selection, I mean, I think John Fish and his team put a good package together, but my understanding is that Marty also did very well for himself when they went out to Denver to actually pitch for the Olympics, which I think says a lot about Marty. I remember I went down to uh, the convention center when they had the big press conference after they were sure. uh, selected. And there were a number, after they made their presentation, reporters were firing questions left and right, left and right, left and right. And I was very impressed with the way Marty was able to handle the room and basically take charge of what was going on there. And so when I look at Marty, and I knew him when he was a state rep, you know, before he became uh, mayor, clearly, but I actually didn't expect this type of, this, this display of growth this quickly. What do you attribute that to? I mean, you've known Marty for a bit. I have. I've known him uh, really through Tom. Uh, Tom. Tom and the mayor are very good friends, and through uh, Tom, uh, I've, I've really got to know the mayor. That's. Uh, but I like him. I, uh, I've always liked him. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought, frankly, it was going to be a tough act to follow uh, Tom and Edo. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But uh, he stepped right up. He's a, he's a different sort of person. Tom and Edo was was Tom and Edo, and, right. and Marty, I think, is saying, I'm going to. You know, I'm not Tom Menino Redux. I'm Marty Walsh. Yeah, I'm, it is I'm the new guy, and I think he's he, he's taken that position. I think he's done very well. One of the things, Tommy, and you've known him for quite some time. He actually came to visit the sheriff's department after he became mayor, and one of the things that he really wanted to do was to go to our recovery unit. And he went in. There were probably about 25 guys there, and clearly, as we all know, he was going through the recovery process. When he spoke, not only could you hear a pin drop but you could actually feel that these guys were really engaged and listening to him. And one of the more poignant points that he made that I thought was really impactful was, he said, 18 years ago is when he went into recovery. 18 years later, he's the mayor of a major metropolitan city. And so what he was saying to these guys is, just get your act together. Take care of yourself, take care of your health, and who knows what could happen. Leave the sauce alone, and you could be fine. Now, it sounds like you've known him for quite some time. Talk about the maturation from young Marty, you know, to where he's at now. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting question, Sheriff, because uh, going back to, I want to say 1981, when a young Marty Walsh laborer who had just gotten out of recovery, um, and recovery is a continuous process, it's a never-ending process, yeah. but uh, he went to work on <laughs> City Council Mike McCormick's campaign, sure. right. working in uh, Savin Hill in Ward 13, Precinct 10. Okay. One of the interesting things he said to me was, I'm here to learn. 
I want to learn everything about this business. Interesting. And you know what? We went from 10th to 1st. To 1st, yeah. And uh, great. he was a big part of that. And uh, one of your assistants, uh, Mr. Geary, another oh, yeah. Yeah, McCormick All-Star yeah. was uh, part of that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. It was so, great. Uh, yeah. but so Eddie worked for you also? And, you and know, in the campaign. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's great. Yeah. It's great. And he was yeah. a volunteer. You know, yeah. I mean, volunteers are what make up city council races, as you know, mm, in the sheriff's race. Tell me about it. It's, uh, it's about volunteering on campaigns. It's not the high-priced consultants that, you know, we all get to know as we try to move up. You know, I'll tell you what. So during my campaign last year, first of all, I felt very fortunate to win. Thank you very much. But equally as important, you're right. If people believe in your message and they believe in what you're trying to get accomplished, it's amazing the way people were really put out to help you oh, sure, win a sure. campaign. It was just extraordinary. We did we did pretty well uh, during the, uh, uh, the results of the final of the campaign, but I was just always amazed at how much people would really bleed, actually. And sometimes I thought that, you know, I was bleeding a whole lot, but I look <laughs> at the guy or the gal next to me, and they were just in the fight just as much as we are, and that's because they believed in the message about keeping our kids, rather, in school, versus in jail, you know? Right. Helping folks as they cycle out of jail to get housing, health care, and employment. And these things were really important to folks, which actually gave me a foundation. It actually gave me strength, frankly, to tell you the truth, because when you have that many people, you know, pulling for you, and I gotta tell you, and I worked with you a little bit on uh, Elizabeth's campaign, uh, Senator mm -hmm. Warren's campaign, and that's when I really began to feel that kind of rock star thing. Now, I wasn't a rock star, she clearly is, but how everybody came together, including yourself. Now, if he worked for you, you've seen what this guy can do out there well, politically, sure. huh? Come on, talk uh, about I, that. Tell I, us some stories. <laughs> I, 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 the one thing I want, I, I'll say two things. I'll say multiple things. <laughs> I, I didn't work for Tom. Oh, uh, please. Tom didn't work for me. <laughs> yeah, I worked you worked for Tom. For Tom, <laughs> Tom uh, in, in addition to being a, a great friend, yeah. has the best people skills of yeah. anybody I know. Yeah. And it, it's evidence. The, the people, the, the, the politicians uh, like uh, John Kerry and, and Ted Kennedy and Elizabeth Warren, who, who call Tom a friend, yeah. uh, is testament to just his people skills. He's, yeah. he's great at it. And in 1981, he and I were friends, but I, I won't say we're great friends. He called me up. He said, why don't you run for city council? I said, what are you, nuts? Yeah. And there hadn't been a city councilor <laughs> from Brighton in 30 over 30 years, okay. and wow. everybody ran at large. There weren't any districts oh, really? uh, okay. back okay. in those days. Mm -hmm. And so Tom and I said, uh, I said to Tom, sure, why not? You know, I was fresh out of law school. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's how you jumped into politics? Pretty much, yeah. Wow. It, it was through Tom's, uh, you know, Tom's suggestion and uh, Roger Sullivan, who worked with Tom. Uh, and we put together in a very, over a year, a great campaign because of Tom and others like Tom, yeah. but that's how I met Marty Walsh and multiple other people who just liked, loved politics. They wanted to be involved, stay involved, and we had a blast. Well, one of the things about Tom, um, <laughs> I know, we're gonna, this, is, yeah, this, this is your day, brother, yeah. you're getting it, that, that I felt very, very cool. Uh, we were in Springfield doing something out in Springfield, and we were at the, some pizza place or someplace, and Tom was, like, orchestrating stuff, and hey, and all the, whole, the whole time he's like this on the phone, but do this, do that. And so I said to Roger Lau, um, Senator Warren's uh, state director now, but at the time was her political director, who I worked up underneath during the campaign, I said, so who's this kid Tom Keating, man? He <laughs> seems to, like, know everybody who's running the show, and Roger said some great things about you. I mean, no, mm -hmm. seriously, I'm not blowing smoke well, Thank now. you. He said some great things just about how he basically learned a lot of his craft, basically sitting at your knee. I'm not, I'm not kidding. You can ask him about this. He said that, you know, this guy just knows politics and he knows people and he knows how yeah, to, the yeah. intersection of I the agree. two. My question to you is, what got you involved? Did you come from a politically involved family? How'd you fall into politics mm -hmm. like this? No, I didn't. I, I really didn't. Uh, my father worked for the MBTA. My mother was a homemaker and she took care of the five Keaty kids mm -hmm. who uh, Mike McCormick knows them well and um, it was just really through student government at uh, uh -huh. St. Mary's in Brooklyn okay. where I went to high school and right. then at UMass Boston and then helping helping local people run but uh, one of the great races was the city council at large race with Mike McCormick and 
Um, so was it 13 seats then? Nine. 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 Okay. Nine. Everybody ran at large. And oh, was, right, exactly. And, and it was before uh, before cable television. Was, there were three, essentially three stations, four, five, seven. I remember and those every days. night, uh, they'd come to the city council. We had Dapper, uh, Dapper O'Neill, and Fred Langone, you. and some yeah. some real characters. Yeah. It was, uh, but city council politics, twenty five years ago, was a big, big deal. I mean, it's it's still important now. But uh, you know, the, there were nine district folks and four at large, and but everybody ran at large, so you really got to know the city. I, I was from Brighton, right. as far west as you know, you really as you can go, and. When I went over to Dorchester, I relied on people like Marty Walsh and folks in South Boston. Uh. So tell me this. Uh, my understanding is when I got, I come, I come up from New York, but I think for the most part, my entire time here, uh, I remember Menino is the man. When I was in college, I really wasn't looking at uh, politics. Uh, and my understanding is that he had a pretty uh, heavy control or oversight of the, uh, of the city council basically, the way he wanted things to when go he when he was That's mayor. Yeah. yeah. Now, that was not the case prior to uh, Mayor Menino becoming mayor? Was um, it a different sort of setup where no. the city council had more flexibility and more latitude? What, what happened, uh, Sheriff, was in 83, they changed the city charter to the current mm -hmm. nine district Fort Lodge. Uh, when Kevin White was mayor, uh, right up through 1981, <clears throat> the, he and the city council were, were in pitch battles every okay, day. Okay. Uh, after '83, Ray Flynn was the mayor for right, ten years. Right. Um, uh, the city council became—I don't know what the right word is—they they weren't as aggressive. They they became much more uh, docile, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. And then when Tom Menino uh, became mayor, he he really uh, he was the boss, and he made it clear to the the, the city councilors who was yeah. in charge. Yeah. Um, I think this council seems to be a little more independent. I was just about to ask yeah. you that, Tom. What do you think about this council and its present configuration? I think I think that the city government, the way it's made up is, it's a strong mayor. We counsel in the sense of, you know, that everything flows through the department heads mm -hmm. and ultimately to the mayor. But the city council, I think, I think there is a a, a more cohesiveness, if you will, you know, being able to pick up a department, calling a department head, picking up the phone and saying, hey, I have this issue, whether it's with the Parks Department, an assessing issue right. or something. And I think that there, right now, the administration and the Walsh administration is really, you know, working with counselors, um, trying to work with them rather than, you know, the powerful mayor versus, let's see if we can work this out, mm -hmm. work together. But at the end of the day, and as Council McCormick knows this, um, the greatest power that the council has is over the city budget. Yeah, right. And so from March <clears throat> until June 30th, when they finally vote on a budget, is their greatest, greatest power. And they can't add to the budget, but they certainly can cut the budget. So let me ask you this. So Marty's done a couple of, I think, things pretty interestingly where he's actually taken a step back. Look at the residency issue that they were going to try to push through. The city council gave some pushback and he stepped back. If you look at where they were going to try to, well, when they closed Long Island and they were going to relocate the homeless folks, first they were going to go up to Radius, uh, the old hospital up in Mission Hill, and there was some pushback and he stepped back. I thought it was conciliatory. I've talked to people that say, well, that may have been a sign of weakness, letting the, the council really enforce their will. I didn't see it as such. Both of you, let's start with you, Mike. What's your thoughts? I mean... Well, I think he said he, he wanted to work with the council. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's easy, uh, it's easy to work with, with a group of folks and, and work out a compromise than mm -hmm. to just impose your will. And I, I think I don't see that as a sign of, of weakness. I, I think the, the residency law, when it first came into... Being in the 70s, the city was in, uh, people were moving out, uh, okay. people were abandoning the city. I mean, that's all changed. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you really need to have the ability to attract top-notch people. Um, so I think the, the residency law, it had, uh, it had some, uh, when it was passed, it was passed for a reason. I think much of that reason has abated. I think the, the administration, that they should take a good look at the city residency law, because I'm not so sure we need it uh, as much as we did in 1976. Do you see it as a kind of a display of finding common ground, working with uh, the uh, city council in this fashion? I think so. I think there is, uh, 
I mean, knowing Mayor Walsh, you know, he's more of let's try to work this out. Mm -hmm. Like, if we have disagreements, let's try to work, you know, together. Let's go be, you know, let's meet. We'll talk about what our issues are, where we can come down, and, you know, to use the name of the show, let's find some common ground here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think he's tried to do that. I think on the residency piece, I think that um, if the whole issue, and Mike is right about this, is that, you know, going back to the 70s, going back to 1975, Kevin White went through a grueling campaign, winning by less than 2% uh, to Joe Timulty. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that, he said, I want to know who can vote for me and who can't. I see. And that's where the residency really came into play. And it was, mm -hmm. there were bumper stickers, reside or resign. Throughout the really? City. I mean, it was that, you know, and, you know, and, wow. and, and like if you lived in Quincy, yeah. you were moving back. Is that a fact? And, and I agree I with Michael that. on this, that it's really changed. Yeah. You know, you look at the real estate prices, you look at the, yeah. the, you know, everything about Boston has changed in the last 40, 50 years. So. You know what, I want to touch on that real estate prices. Um, so we have a lot of good talent that either has grown up here or have come here to go to school. But then they move out, out of, outside of the city principally because, or in, not principally, but either housing or education, you know, are maybe two of the main causes that folks leave the city. Is there anything that we can do, is there anything that the mayor can do to really get more low income and moderate housing? I know he's trying, but is it a reality? Is it something that can happen here, or is it beyond the pale now? What do you think? Well, you're looking at, you're looking at me, so I'll, I'll take the first uh, stab at that. Um, I think that, you know, colleges and universities, which are one of the economic engines besides healthcare, mm -hmm. which drives the city and drives the region. Mm -hmm. I think the whole issue of dormitory and building dormitories is, is a key component yeah. to freeing up more affordable housing throughout the city. Uh, but that's going to take time. Yeah. And one of the issues of building dormitories creates, you know, not in my backyard issues, but at the same time, when students are living off campus and paying $2,500, $3,000, yeah. $4,000, $5,000, yeah. and Mike can tell you about that because he's <laughs> experienced it the same last year with his son. Mm. Well, and, uh, you know, I, I, Boston College uh, has, uh, where, where you graduated from sheriff and with time has an affiliation, and I do through paying tuition checks. Uh, <laughs> the junior year, uh, the first two years you live on campus in a yeah. dormitory, and mm -hmm. the, the junior year, uh, you live off campus and you know all those kids that are out there renting apartments are taking apartments away from you know folks who I see what you're saying. Right, you know, right, right. That, that's where the dormitory right. build out comes in. Exactly. I see. I so you, you build dormitories, you keep the kids on campus, they're safe, you, they're under the, the watchful eye of the you know the folks like Tom and then you free up units for, for or build more units. Or, mm -hmm. and, and I see uh, today the Catholic Church uh, w w is talking about building uh, rental units on their land. I don't know if they're market or, oh, or, really? okay. or, or by the okay. by the uh, cathedral. Yeah. Uh, okay. There's there, there's property around the city that. Uh, but you're right. You can, know, can be built on. my junior year, a good buddy and I uh, actually moved off campus and we moved down to uh, Park Drive, right around the corner from sure. Fenway Park, and we had a one bedroom apartment. You know, he had the living room as his bedroom, and I had the bedroom. But it only cost us three and a quarter, you know, for a one bedroom, I mean, one bedroom apartment down there. Now I think that that type of apartment goes for fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars Right. You know, that's just way probably too much higher. Money. Well, Might be, right? Yeah. Probably higher. That's just way and, too and much. And they rent, uh, you know, some of these landlords are pretty unscrupulous. They'll rent a, a house to five kids on the lease and there'll be yeah. 20 kids living there. Yeah. And it's not, I mean, it's not right. It's unsafe, too. Yeah. You know, another thing about the city, uh, I, I had friends when I first came up to Boston to go to school would say to me, why do you want to go to Boston? It's a racist city. I came up in 77, and this was, what, four years after the 73 busing stuff. And so when I first got here, I didn't, I mean, I'd heard about busing. I didn't know much about that whole deal. And what I say to my friends today is between the time that I arrived and now, this city, when you talk about diversity, has just grown, I think, miraculously. I think, uh, and, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I really experienced this during the campaign. Every community that I went to, whether it was in Brighton or East Boston, Revere, Chelsea, uh, wherever I was, 
all of the communities, first and foremost, the thing that really impressed me were there were adults that have kids that still hung out with their elementary school buddies. You know, they all kind of grew up together, right. stayed close together, and were still friends. But I thought everybody was very accommodating, very welcoming, you know, very gracious. And now you have, you know, black folks living in South Boston and white folks living in Roxbury. I think this city is an example of just how diversity can work. Let me start with you this time. I was looking at you, but I'll look at him now. <laughs> you know, just touch on the, sure. the whole diversity aspect of Boston and what, it, what used to be said about it and what the reality is. I think the reality is Boston is a far different city uh, today in 2000, yeah. in, the, in the 21st century, in the 2014 and 15 than it was in the 70s. Uh, and a lot of it can be attributed, I think, to uh, Mayor Flynn, uh, Mel King. Uh, that race with, in 83. That, ra that race yeah. in 83 yeah. was, a, was a really a prototype of how, how to do it, mm -hmm. do it well. I think Mayor Flynn deserves a lot of credit for uh, his efforts at uh, diversity and, and changing sort of the racial mm -hmm, tenor. Mm -hmm. I think Mayor Menino uh, deserves a lot, a lot of credit that. for 20 yeah. years, and, yeah. and I think uh, Marty Walsh is doing an exceptionally good job. But I, I think if you had to say, you know, capsulize it, sum it up, it's a different city. It's a great city. And, and that's just to revert for a moment to the, the, the whole Olympic. This isn't the Boston of the 70s. This mm -hmm. is the Boston that uh, you know, we should be able to say, we can do this, we can, we can make a, a, an Olympic pitch that will be the envy of all the other competitors. Talk to me about diversity, and talk to me about diversity at schools like Boston College. So when I went to BC back in the late 70s, early 80s, there really weren't a lot of students of color there. There are more now than when mm -hmm. I went there. Um, but there also, I didn't feel like an outcast. I didn't feel like this was a place that I was going to be uncomfortable. And the only thing that really made me uncomfortable coming from New York City is that they roll up the sidewalks at 730. <laughs> and so that's why I moved down to Park Drive. But other than that, do you see diversity really flourishing at some of our major education institutions as well as throughout the city, Tom? Absolutely. And, you know, if you're, I mean, look at, 250,000 students descend upon the greater Boston area, coming from all different parts of the world to come to some of the greatest institutions, whether it's Harvard University, BU, Boston College, Northeastern, mm -hmm. and even some of our great state institutions. And so, um, and what drives them? It drives them because we're a world-class city. And part of being a world-class city means that we're open to everybody. Mm -hmm. and. And, you know, whether it's Roxbury Community College, Bunker Hill Community College, or Boston College, it's a very, very welcoming place, especially for undergraduates. And they, they come here, they get educated, they enjoy the sports teams, they enjoy their college teams, yeah. Yeah. and they enjoy the, the, the environment, you know, hopping on the T, taking taxis, taking Ubers, walking home. I mean, it, it, it really enlivens the city. And I think we're the envy of a lot of other cities mm -hmm. throughout the country mm -hmm. that say, how can Boston have mm -hmm. some of the greatest medical institutions and some of the greatest higher ed institutions in the world right. in this place? Right. And it's right. just, uh, yeah, absolutely. That's a good point. Yeah. And actually, during the, the, the fiscal depression, or just short of depression, cities like Detroit and Cleveland and other cities, they really couldn't cut muster. Boston did seem to do pretty darn well. Well, we have a lot going for us. We have, you know, we have an ocean. We're right on the ocean, the Atlantic mm -hmm. Ocean. We have mountains. You can ski. You right. can do anything, frankly, that you, that you really want to do. It's right. a four-season city. You can have winter sports, summer, spring, football. Uh, I was recently in Florida, and I'm frankly sure if I wish I was there right now. <laughs> <laughs> I was on the West Coast. I thought you were going to say recently you were playing football. <laughs> no, oh, no, God, no. But I, I was in, I was in a, a restaurant on the beach, and it was, uh, every, it was the West Coast. Most everyone in the restaurant was from Indiana, Wisconsin, uh, Illinois, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. that whole Midwestern uh, gang where uh, you know, everybody's kind of got a dour expression because they're frozen, you know, yeah. before they get out of yeah. Wisconsin. But they are so jealous of Boston. Yeah. The minute you say you're from Boston, it's yeah. this, it's the uh, the Patriots, it's yeah. the Bruins, it's yeah. the Celtics. Yeah. Um, it's the schools. It's the schools. It's the, it's the healthcare. It's the whole deal. And you're right. My daughter yeah. went to BC or my yeah. son went to 
Harvard or, yeah. uh, and stayed there. Yeah. And I wish they came back, but I'm delighted they stayed yeah. in a great city like Boston. It's the best. Beautiful. All right, guys, look, we're about to go to a break, but on the other side, I want to talk about all this new stuff that we've got going on in politics, a new governor, new attorney general, new Senate president, so on and so forth. So, folks, do uh, stay tuned. We'll be back. And on the other side, we're really going to get into a spirit, spirited conversation about uh, New England politics. Please do stay tuned. Hart, what's going on? I'm leaving. Why? What did I do? Not enough. You constantly ignore me. You barely eat anything healthy. You're half as active as you used to be. The pressure is just too much. I quit. OK, I get it. I'll do better. Just please, don't leave. OK, but remember, if I go, you go. Listen to your heart. Don't let it quit on you. Uncontrolled high blood pressure could lead to stroke, heart attack, or death. Get yours to a healthy range before it's too late. Michael Adams? Here. Michael Adams? Here. <laughs> Michael Adams? Here! Michael Adams? Students who miss 18 days of school in any grade risk falling behind and not graduating. Absences add up. Keep track at boostattendance.org today. One day, when the glory comes, it will be ours. Dr. King, what's your next move? In March, from Selma to Montgomery. Selma is loud for every man, woman, and child. We will not wait any longer. We run up a crowd. One eyes have seen the glory. Welcome back to Common Ground, an inside look at Suffolk County. I'm your host, Sheriff Steve Tompkins. I'm here with uh, Mike McCormick and Tom Keedy, and we're talking all things politics. And guys, let's transition now. We talked about uh, municipal government. We talked about uh, Marty and, and what he's getting done. Let's shift over to uh, the state now, and let's talk about the new governor. What's your early impressions of how Governor Baker is putting his team together and the folks, albeit very bipartisan, you know, are kind of coalescing and coming together? What's your thoughts? I think that's so far. He's he's impressed. He's impressed me. Uh, I think he's his team that he's put together is an impressive group, as you've said, bipartisan folks, uh, Republicans, Democrats, long-term Democratic. Uh, Stephanie Pollock's a long-time mm -hmm. policy uh, MB, uh, which was an interesting choice yeah, for I him to pick. You I know, because so, I, but, some of their arguments are on the opposite side of the tracks. No pun intended. You right. know, but for him to pick, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, it was a very interesting pick. She's very bright. Uh, she was the head of the Conservation Law Foundation. Mm -hmm. I had some dealings with her uh, years oh, ago. Okay. Uh, very, very transportation-oriented. Very smart. Um, uh, I, unfortunately for the governor and for the whole transportation world in the yeah. state, we've just got slammed with four yeah. bad storms yeah. back to back yeah. to back. And, yeah. uh, but we'll dig out, you know, and as uh, the mayor of Buffalo used to say, God put it here and he'll take it out. So. <laughs> let's, let's stay on the transportation sure. uh, discussion for a moment, Tom. And so clearly, as you mentioned, Mike, the storms were pretty bad. But my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, that some of the difficulties with the MBTA far predates these storms and probably goes back to 02, maybe 04, maybe some of the big dig stuff with the transference of fiscal whatever. What's your thoughts on how we get our arms around this whole MBTA situation and get it back going the right way? Well, I, I, I think the governor has been a, dealt a tough blow. You know, I mean, just go back, you know, he gets inaugurated, he has his inauguration ball, gets home, and I'm just repeating what he said at the chamber, gets home and gets a call and says, you got to come back to the convention center for, you know, an announcement on the Olympics right. at 7 o'clock. Right, right. He goes from there to start, starting to roll out his, his, his new administration, his new cabinet members, and he really hasn't had a honeymoon. Right. Um, and all of a sudden he's got, you know, the first snowstorm, the second snowstorm, the third snowstorm. And he's also faced with making decisions of a $760 million deficit. Right. And so it's all about how do you focus, you know, and how do you give yourself the time to figure out. And while you have the $760 million cut, mm -hmm. then you have 
three major storms and then four major storms, you then are also supposed to be putting together a budget. That's, That's supposed right. to be filed by the, you know, by Is that March. early uh, March, right? Early it's coming March. up, right, okay. And so I think the governor really, you know, has done a remarkable job uh, working with, and I know that the communication between the city of Boston, the mayor of Boston, and his office has been, I would say, very good. But again, it's nature. You know, we yeah. have 107 inches of snow. Yeah. You know, do you close the T? Do you keep it open? Um, school, we're going to have school. We're not going to have school. The Mass Turnpike, when was the last time the Mass Turnpike was closed? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't recall. I don't, not me. I'm right. not even sure in 78 when it was closed. I, in full disclosure, I represent uh, Keolis, who runs the commuter rail. They were the mm -hmm. successful bidder. Mm -hmm. And essentially, they've inherited equipment uh, that's 40 years old. Yeah. That yeah. Uh, yeah. it, it doesn't, uh, doesn't work. And in cold weather, it really doesn't work. Yeah. And mm -hmm. we haven't, we, Massachusetts, hasn't made the investment in capital projects yeah. in equipment that we should have been making for the last 25 or 30 years. And there isn't a person, whether it's Dr. Scott or anyone else, who yeah. can say, I'm going to turn this around overnight. Right, right. We have to start spending money, um, tax money. I, I don't know how else, you know, you can't keep saying right. no, 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 right. and then complain when the tea doesn't run right. and doesn't function. So, you know, mentioning uh, Dr. Scott, one of the things I found very extraordinarily interesting, as a matter of fact, about her press conference, was and some tried to say she was defiant, she was angry. I didn't see, actually I didn't see it as either. I, I saw it as someone who was a professional that was very passionate, not only about the institution, but about the people that work at that institution. And I thought it was a clarion call, frankly, to say, look, guys and ladies, you don't want to spend tax dollars, you don't want to tax and that sort of thing, but if you want to have a major transportation system throughout, not just southeastern Massachusetts, but throughout the Commonwealth, you're going to have to raise the money. You're going to have to spend the money. You're going to have to update this. Now, I know taxes are a bad word, but don't you think that we, we've got to do something, Tommy? I mean, we've got to raise taxes or something because we're talking about if that transportation system fails in Boston, isn't that going to have a kind of ripple effect throughout the Commonwealth? Oh, absolutely. And when we're talking about transportation, we're not just talking about the MBTA or the commuter rail, but you're also going to look at Worcester and Springfield yeah. and then the Cape yeah. and sort of how does that all play into this. You know, and what's interesting is, well, while people talk about you know, no new taxes, you know, they voted on, you know, a gas tax. But recently, gas went from 380 mm -hmm, down to mm -hmm. $1.98. I remember, yes. Okay, yes. now, wouldn't it be creative <laughs> if we could do a gas tax at $1.98? Because I don't think people would feel that pinch right. like they would uh, if you're at 378. Good point, good point. Because, yeah. but at the same time, I think that what has to happen is the trust has to be built back up yeah. amongst the public because I think there's a sense of, okay, I just did 30 cents, you know, I went up a nickel the first time in, I want to say 21 years or 30 years mm -hmm. that that went up. Um, is it really going to go into fix and repairing? Yeah, the yeah, transit? right, 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 exactly. And, and exactly, how much money is it going to take right. to do that? You know, and we're Boston, and we're the greater Boston area, but when you have cars that are 40 years old, it's remarkable that they are running, and it's a credit to the people who keep them together. I mean, and, and I think that, you know, people have to understand if we're going to do bond issues and we're going to put money into, into public transportation, people have to see the results. Right. Not in five years and not in ten years. But it has to be, you know, in the next two years. Right, right, right. And, you know, I, I think Governor Baker was right, or it was maybe Governor Dukakis, that in a time of crisis like right now, mm -hmm. this is when we should be mm -hmm. looking for the T to help mm -hmm. us move around. Mm -hmm. And right now, you know, it's, it's on a sort of a weekend service, service call. Yeah. So yeah. I think um, we have to come together as a, as a city, a region, and as a state to really tackle this problem. And let's leave our egos outside the room yeah. when we have that discussion. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's clearly sent a message about, about the need. And it is a crisis. Tommy just talked about having um, 
confidence on both sides between the government and the constituencies of the government, the people that actually pay taxes and so on and so forth, confidence that what is said is going to get done is going to get done. Talk to me about the confidence between the Senate, the House, and then the governor. When uh, Governor Patrick, who, who was there, just left, um, who appointed me, thank you, thank you, appreciate mm. it. Um, they just seem to be a little bit combative uh, between the, the Senate and the House, particularly around this whole issue of transportation, so on and so forth. He tried to raise a certain amount of money, they wouldn't give the whole thing to him. Do you think that the House, the Senate, and uh, the executive branch can all get on the same page now? Well, uh, Governor Baker ran on a, <coughs> a, a sort of a pledge, no, no new taxes. Uh, so I'd be surprised uh, to see him come in with a tax uh, revenue package. Mm -hmm. uh, but frankly, you know, I think Tom raised an interesting point. We're, we're very cynical in the state when it comes to taxes. I think if, uh, if there's a tax proposal uh, and that money is going, is directed at something we, uh, you know, capital projects that we can all see, feel, and touch tactile. We, we know they're going to be buying new trains and they, uh, replacing trains that are 30, 40 years old. Uh, I have a lot of confidence in Speaker DeLeo and uh, uh, the new Senate. Uh, uh, Stan uh, Rosenberg. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, Stan Rosenberg, yep. who uh, is very smart, very policy-driven mm -hmm. person, very bright guy. Uh, I, I'd be surprised if, if they don't figure out a way to work together. So you know what's funny about those relationships is You've got um, um, Speaker DeLeo, who's like, I guess, the old head now. He's been up there for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And he's got two neophytes, you know, in the new Senate president and in the governor. So does he rule the roost up there? Is it DeLeo's shop now? Or who's actually running the show up there? What do you think? I think, I think it's a combination. You know, number one, you know, the speaker does have the experience. But, you know, Stan Rosenberg's been a state senator for a number of years. Right. You know, he's been in leadership. And... You know, he's in a new position, but I think, you know, that, trust me, that Senate President Rosenberg is going to, he knows, he knows how to get things done, yeah, does. and so doesn't Speaker DeLeo. Oh, yeah. and, and the other thing is, is, you know, Governor Baker, you know, he was chief of staff, he was a department head, he was a secretary. Yeah. I mean, he, head of a &F? He, Head of a &F, right? He, he knows, I mean, like, he knows the budget. Right, right. And, you know, right. so you're not bringing in rookies here. Right. And I, I think that that, you know, to, I agree with Michael on this, is that, you know, you're going to see them work together. And, you know, it's unfortunate that this type of crisis brings us together. And I think, unfortunately, in government, crisis moves the ball forward a lot quicker. So but it may, may not be, particularly if we can get our arms around it, it's unfortunate. Correct. You know, it just, it just sped up the process where these guys really have to work on something that's major, and really get a sense of, can we work together? And I agree with you. I think they will be able to work together at the end of the day. Now, you're a lawyer. You're not a lawyer. No. Are you a lawyer? Okay. You just know a <laughs> lot of lawyers. That's why you like them so you much. You just played one on TV, right? We right. just hired them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just hired them. You stayed at all, a Holiday Inn last night. Right, right, right. <laughs> plays on TV, right? Talk to me about our new Attorney General. What do you think, Amara? Uh, I think she's terrific. Uh, she's... Uh, you know, whether you like partners or you don't, and most people, uh, you know, think they're uh, kind of the 800-pound gorilla, yeah. first thing she did was step right out and just say no. And yeah. that took a lot of courage. Yeah. And uh, partners is, a, you know, a huge employer, and, you know, they were about to uh, consume two hospitals and... You know, it took a lot of courage for her to come out and say no. Forget it. Yeah, she's it's not. Got a, a, it's, she's not got a, it's not a good idea. She's got a lot of brass. I think um, so. During the campaign, I had a chance. You know, well, you know, you know, you both know campaigns, and so until you go on stage to make your pitch, you're all kind of like in the green room, and you're kind of kibitzing and hanging out. And I was very impressed with uh, how she comported herself, the things that she yeah, said she, that she very wanted to woman. get done. But I was just also very impressed with the fact that this is not going to be a pushover. Not to say that Martha or any other attorney general was, but that, right. you know, she's a person who's got convictions that she doesn't have a problem with standing on and talking about and really trying to effectuate the change that she, she wants she to bring She reminds me of when I first, uh, my first real legal job was working for Frank Bellotti in uh, 1975, 76. I just met him. And, uh, smooth, smooth oh, customer. Frank's 91 Whoa, years old. Oh, smooth is, customer. The tan and the whole uh, deal. He's but, good, you yeah. know, uh, Sheriff, beyond that, he was uh, the attorney general. He gotcha. is what 
you want it to be. It was a part-time position. Frank took it over, made all uh, all the AGs, assistant AGs, full-time. Okay. Hired some exceptionally bright people, with one Good. notable exception, me. But oh, you know, stop. But uh, <laughs> uh, 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 the, the the attorney general, Mar Healy, reminds me a lot of Frank, which oh, to me you. is that's is, a heck of a compliment. Uh, to me, it is. Uh, yeah. Frank was the he's the gold standard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think she's. Uh, I expect some pretty good yeah, things. I think, you, you know. I, I think you're going to be right. Yeah. What do you think about Deb Goldberg, the new treasurer? I, I've met her. I like her a lot. Do she's, you know Debbie? Uh, yes, I have. Okay. I, you know, she's a BC law graduate. I did not know that. She's no kidding. Boston College. She's grad crazy smart too. I mean, she's got a lot bright. of intelligence. Yeah. Very bright. Yeah. Woman. And she also has a uh, child, not a child, but young adult that's graduating in June. Oh, really? Okay. Because I did okay. one to her in the muds during one of the football games. No so. kidding. Yeah. In fact, I was very surprised. I thought, um, help me with the last name, Barry, uh, the state senator. Feingold. Feingold. You know, coming out of the blocks, it sounded like it seemed like Barry was going to be the guy, you know, that was going to be the next right. treasurer. And then Tommy uh, Conroy jumped in, you know. And so the, the scuttlebutt that I heard was Tommy's going to have the reps and, and, uh, and Barry's going to have the Senate. And so my question was, who's left? And I remember Roger Lau and others were trying to get me to endorse Debbie at the time and we're at the convention. Mm -hmm. And she came out, first of all, my background is in communications. I've made a ton of music videos and industrials and political ads and that sort of thing. And I thought her video, first and foremost, was extraordinary. The way it got her message across, explained who she is and what she wants to get done. And I actually thought her, her stump speech, you know, at the convention was pretty darn good also. Mm -hmm. I thought the convention went on too long, but that's another story. Um, Talk to Roger. You know, well, I did, as a matter of fact. <laughs> I went up to Roger, and I said, first I told Roger, because he was doing some stuff for her, I said, let her know that I will support her. And then, can you do something about getting us the heck out of here? You know, <laughs> but I thought she was pretty sharp. You yeah. know, and I, and I expect, a, I don't know a heck of a lot about the treasurer. Clearly, I know what treasurers do, but I don't know a heck of a lot of, about it. But well, it's a big deal. It yeah. runs the lottery. Uh, they run the school building program. Okay. Uh, they deal with the state pension fund. It's a huge uh, uh, responsibility. And I think uh, Deb Goldberg, at least in my memory, is the, the, the first treasurer in recent memory, my, my memory anyway, who isn't running for something else, running for governor. She yeah, yeah, wants to be yeah, the treasurer yeah, and said, yeah. that's my job, and I think yeah. she'll do a very good job. Yeah, yeah. In fact, it was interesting that you say that, because Stevie, uh, who I, I supported, uh, Grossman, uh, his good friend, yeah. but I always got the feeling when he became treasurer, I always had the feeling that he wanted to run for governor or do something else, you know, and it was funny. Let me tell you this quick story. So I become, I, I get appointed, right? I get a call from Steve. Hey, Steve, let's go to lunch, right? So I think it's a congratulations <laughs> lunch for me, right? <laughs> we go to the lunch and we're sitting there and we're, we're, we're mixing it up a little bit and he says, you know, the worst kept secret here is that I'm running for governor. You know, and I like your support. And I think I was like governor, like maybe, I mean, uh, listen to me, uh, sheriff, maybe three days, you know. And so I actually, not that I would have said no, but I actually didn't know how to say no, you know. I was like, wow, this guy just caught me out there and asked for support. Nobody's ever asked me for support. How do you say yes or no? Let me think about it. Let me get back to you. And, uh, and I said, sure, Steve, because I used to be at Demick Community Health Center years mm -hmm. ago, and his family business did all of our collateral material, all of our printing and stuff like that. He was always a nice guy. Family's great. So I said, you know, I'll support you. And I thought it was the right choice. I liked him mm -hmm. a lot, you know. And then uh, when uh, Martha won the primary, you know, then we all jumped on and tried to help her, you know, sure. with her race. He, he's, Steve Grossman is a maniacal campaigner. I mean, Isn't he, he, though? He would be at, at events... The sheriff, he wouldn't go to a gunpoint. And he's out in the western part of the state. He's right. down in Fall River. And some, right, there were right, three right. people and Steve Grossman. Yeah. Um, and frankly, if he had two or three more weeks left in the campaign, yeah. he might have won. He might have won. Yeah. yeah, he's sharp and he knows everything. The thing about Very Steve guy. That, that amazed me, everywhere we went, not only did he know whoever was in the room, but he seemed to know them intimately. He knew stories about them and about their families and the whole yeah, deal. Exactly. And so uh, I wish him well. <coughs> you know, he, he's a good guy. Yes, he you is. Know, uh, I wish him well. Tommy, let me go to you on the Elizabeth Warren um, issue. Now, first and foremost, every time I see her on TV, I get all charged up and I say to my wife and my kids, I worked for her, I worked for her. But how do you think she's conducting herself down in D.C. and trying to get her message across about what the citizens of this country need to make them whole? Well, I, as you know, during the campaign, 
you know, she said that she was going to be the people's advocate. Mm -hmm. And and I have to tell you, she's gone down there. She's the senior senator, um, and she's. I think she's holding the banks accountable. She's holding, you know, big business, um, and she's taken. She's taken on the Democratic president on appointments, yeah. and um, she's no wallflower. No. And uh, no. and I think that's resonating. You know, different organizations now are saying, "What about Elizabeth Run? Run yeah. Elizabeth Run?" Yeah. There's stuff going out in Iowa and there's stuff up in New Hampshire, and she yeah. continues to say no. And I don't think she will, frankly. I mean, I don't know what she's going to do, clearly, but I think she's going to stick to her guns. Kind of like when uh, Governor Patrick said that he was going to stay for his mm -hmm. entire term. You know, I get the sense that she, I don't mean unless something extraordinary happens, I think she'll stay. I mean, what do you think? I think she's going to stay, but, you know, you never say never. Right. And I will say this about her, you know, we, Remember that she's originally from Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and one of the, the first primaries is Iowa. Iowa is an agriculture state, yeah. and I think Elizabeth Warren could talk agriculture in uh, that state. Yeah. I yeah. think that she could absolutely connect with the populace, the Democrats out there. Um, I've been on the winning side in Iowa, and I've been on the losing side in Iowa. Mm -hmm. 1980 with Ted Kennedy, and in Ooh. 2004 with John Kerry. Mm -hmm. And Iowa is a great, great, great state for liberal Democrats to, to win. And I think that if she decides, yeah. if, right. and our good friend Roger Lau and people who <laughs> watch this, <laughs> um, she, right. she could sell in Iowa. Yeah. You know, yeah. and remember, yeah. you know, Hillary Clinton uh, and my Hillary Clinton friends are not going to like this, but when she ran, she spent $27 million mm -hmm. in a Democratic primary wow. and lost. Wow. I mean, to I Barack Obama. Yeah. $27 million. million dollars. Mike and I could run that campaign. Yeah. We could give every farmer in Iowa <laughs> yeah. a John Deere <laughs> tractor right. and still be able to go to Florida next weekend. Yeah. And, still <laughs> <laughs> and I just yeah. think that, yeah. you know, that Iowa, in order to win Iowa, you have to spend time in Iowa. It is not just retail politics, but it is, it's like running for sheriff, it's like running for city council. Yeah. It is one door knocking, one door upon another. And um, I think, you know, if the opportunity presents itself, I think Elizabeth Warren would be someone to watch, but she has to want it. Yes. And you have to want it in your heart. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, you've yes. experienced it yeah, and you've yeah, experienced yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I want to run for city council, yeah. I want to run for sheriff. Yeah. Well, if you want to do that, number one, your family has to be behind you. And number two, you have to be committed and dedicated. True, true. You can't say, I'm getting in, and then go, I really don't like yeah, this. Yeah, that's true. So right now, on the Democratic side, at least for now, it seems like um, Hillary will be the one who's going to jump out there. We'll see how things pan out on that. But let me ask you, and I want to go back to you, Tommy, about the Republican side for the 2016 President, uh, presidential candidates, what do you think? Um, <laughs> I don't know much about them other than it's like a reality show. Let's yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, it's like a reality show. I mean, four years ago, <laughs> they put out this, I, I remember one debate where they had Rick Santorum and they had all these other people, Donald Trump. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I don't think we've heard the last of Donald Trump. And, and oh, please, God, they, they just please. don't have the ability to put out candidates and, and let them run without just beating them up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and they, the, the lot, they, think, they seem to think the louder they are, yeah. the more people are going to like them. I don't and that's get not the it. case. I, I, I just don't get it. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't get it. When you talk about two big demographic groupings, uh, women and immigrants, you know, they seem to me to consistently say the wrong thing. You know, what's your thought on, on, on the Republican side of the ticket and what well, would go on there presidentially? I think there's two types of campaigns. Mm -hmm. It's the primary season, yeah. which gets you the, you know, the, the Donald Trumps and, you know, the, you know, just very, very conservative right wing, uh -huh. uh, which can sell. I just said that, you know, in Iowa, you know, Democrat populist, liberals, vote on the Democratic side, well, then you have the conservative right-wing 
Republican side. Mm -hmm. And people like, you know, if you look, Mike Huckabee, mm -hmm. okay, Rick Santorum, who won, who won Iowa, mm -hmm. right? over Mitt Romney, but mm -hmm. wasn't declared the winner for two weeks. And then you yeah, have Sarah right, Palin. Right, right. Um, I think there are two different types of campaigns. I think Bush has to hold his own and wait till he gets to New Hampshire mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. hope for Florida and put together. But it's, it's gonna be a long process. Why, why not just avoid Iowa? And just say, you know what? I'm not gonna go to these bean suppers and, and Didn't Giuliani or one of these guys try that? Yeah. Well, a couple of guys tried. I think so, uh, but uh, you know, Romney, Romney's problem was he tried to you know attack way to the right, and he just looked foolish. Mm -hmm. Romney, I thought, was a pretty good governor mm -hmm. when he when he was here. Okay. When he ran for president, as Tom correctly says, you the primary is just a whole different thing. You have to go out and and say things that you really don't mean. Right. 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 Um, <coughs> and you know this. Uh, well, it's called Romney Care, and now they, they call it Obamacare, but in Massachusetts it worked. So why, why not go out and, and why go out and spend your entire campaign saying, I was hoodwinked into passing right. it? You know, right. it's a, just That's so the other thing I don't understand about the Republicans. They tried to re repeal this 50 some odd times now. Yeah, I mean, when's happen. enough enough? I mean, come on. I mean, I think they look foolish. Is the Tea Party still as vocal, as impactful as they once were several years back? Well, in a, in a Republican yeah. primary, yeah. absolutely, yeah. because if you have 10 people running, how many votes are going to take to win an Iowa caucus? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, and then, you know, but as you get into places like Florida, the bigger states like California or New York, I don't think they, they really count, but in places like Iowa, mm -hmm. okay, Virginia, you have 10 people running, you have six people yeah. running, mm -hmm. they get a certain percentage of those votes. Yeah. Guess what? They're there. Yeah, they're in the mix. So why not just bypass Iowa? Yeah. And say, I'm going to go to a state where that people can vote. That could be a slogan. Well, like, instead of these let's, silly let's caucuses, go to, a, go, to a, go to New Hampshire where yeah. people vote. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's a popular we bring vote. Him, we got to bring them to Iowa. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let them experience it. Huh? Yeah, exactly. Hey, look, guys, we're, we're out of time. I really want to thank you for coming on today. This has been a great conversation. Thank and you, I'd sir. love to have you back at some point once we get, uh, we get beyond all of this crazy snow. But I really do appreciate you coming on today. Love to be back. Okay. Thanks very much for having Great. us. Great. Thank you. All right, folks, look, we're out of here. Uh, we'll be back again next week. Until then, you take care of yourself. We hope to see you soon. Peace.